you know, the theater in its entirety is built on relationships, right? There are very few industries where even your staunchest competitors you partner with on much of what you do, right? So I argue it's unique that way, right? The, the, the same three to 500 people, you keep coming back into each other's aura and you work on projects. Some of them work. Sometimes when a project doesn't work, you bond even more in failure. And so he really believed in the long Hall of all the relationships that you put together over the course of your career in the theater. Hi, everyone. This is Hal Luftig with my Broadway podcast network show, Broadway Biz, where every episode I will chat with my friends, some of the top theater professionals in the business, about the business of Broadway. Nick Scandalius is the executive vice president of the Needlander Organization, which is one of the largest theater owners and producing organizations in the world. I've had the pleasure of working with Nick over the years, and I am honored to call him a colleague and more importantly, a friend. I'm so grateful Nick is joining me today on Broadway Biz. I'm very pleased today to welcome to the show one of my best friends and one of the best men in show business. Let's all give a big Broadway biz welcome to Nick Scandalius. Hey, Nick. Hey, Al. Twice back at you. How you doing? How is everybody? I'm good. Everybody's good. Me good. Kids good. Everybody good. You guys? Uh, We're good, too. We're good, too. We, uh, you know, we're just trying to lounge through the summer, and it's, you know, New York City in the summer. What could I tell you, right? You know, Nick, I was trying for the life of me. Maybe you could jog my memory, because, you know, I am old. Do you remember the first time you and I became, like, aware of each other, like we entered each other's orbit? Because... I remember lots of things, like the time we went upstate with Jimmy Sr., and you and I were singing Dream Girls in the back seat, and he said, you two should do a show. Um, I remember funny (laughs) stuff like that, but I can't remember, like, did we officially meet? How did that, do you have a recollection of that? I, I, I don't, so you've just kind of, maybe you've been with me since birth. And I just didn't know it. (laughs) You know, if I had to pick a vague recollection, it was when you were working with Barry Weisler early on. I remember Jimmy Sr., and I just love telling this story. When we were doing my first uh, stab at lead producing was Thoroughly Modern Millie. And we were out at the La Jolla Playhouse doing, you know, our, our tryout. And it was... I don't know, I guess 2000, which was a real problematic thing, not because the show was because it just was technically, I think, more complicated than they realized. So like turntables kept stopping and, and, you know, chandeliers kept falling and it wasn't Phantom of the Opera. And I remember Jimmy Sr. and Jr. and maybe you flew out to La Jolla, and it was one of those performances, like I said, that wasn't great. And we got back to New York trepidatiously. I made an appointment to see you guys. And I'll never forget Jimmy Needlander said, you know, you you know, that girl's a real star and you're a real good producer. And I'm going to give you a theater to to open on Broadway. And like I almost wept right there. Annie, get your gun closed at the marquee. Annie closed. He kept that theater. He promised to keep that theater available for me. And he kept his word. He said, you know, when you're ready in, in the spring, you have a theater and he was a man of his word. And I, I, that is the single most, and maybe that's where I really got to know you well, because then you and I had to, you know, roll up our sleeves and dig the, into the trenches and figure out how to make that happen. 
Yeah, well, that's where we really got to know each other was on Thoroughly Modern Millie. And especially when the deluge curtain went down, we really got to know each other. (laughs) (laughs) I've had a few deluge curtains uh, in my day. Yes, I know. And two of them were with my shows. (laughs) When it happened in Evita, and you came running, you were the best. You came running down to that theater, and we all had hair dryers trying to dry out. It was our first preview, and we were trying to dry out the the new orchestrations hadn't been copied yet because it was still in previews, right? Who does that? So we had on the seats all the different orchestrations, and we all had hair dryers, and you were helping dry. <laughs> And, and, you know, when paper dries, it gets very brittle. So that was fun, too. <laughs> and I just slipped and through. Sadly, yeah. I knew to get the hair dryers because I had had that happen before <laughs> at Sunset Boulevard in the mid-90s. Oh, good. I thought it was just me. It was not my first time with a hair dryer and an orchestra. At the rodeo. At the, I know. I know. And I just looked at you and I remember saying, Nick, I love you dearly. But what's up with this theater? (laughs) So I'm going to start off just asking if you could tell some of our listeners who may or may know, what is, you know, what is the Nederlander organization? The Nederlander organization or Nederlander, as it's commonly referred to, is a family business that was started in 1912, basically operates, owns and operates Broadway type theaters and produces Broadway type shows and and tours. And we have theaters around the country and we have nine on Broadway, three in London, one, one of which we own with Andrew Lloyd Webber. And it's always been operated by family. Niederlander, as people know it today, uh, while it was founded by D.T. Niederlander, Jimmy Sr., uh, God rest his soul's father. It was really built by Jimmy Niederlander Sr. So what people understand as Niederlander today uh, was something that he either, you know, masterminded, as he would say, 50% with skill and 50% with luck. It now is one of the largest owners of theaters in the country or world and one of its largest producers. Well, I, I just have to tell all listeners, Jimmy Sr. and Jimmy Jr. blush, but one of the things I love uh, about the Needlanders and you, Nick, is that you, the family, is when they become your friend, they are your friend for life. Everything that I've ever done since the early modern Millie has, I've always gone to the Lean Landers for sage advice, guidance. Jimmy Sr. was the best at that. And he used to do it with, with such panache and such humor. He was that old-fashioned producer that, that just took people under his wing. You know, and, and, and once you were there, and you're very much like that too, Nick. Once you're there, you're there. You know, he believed in relationships, right? And and the truth is, that, you know, of all the valuable lessons I've learned, and there are they are countless from him, because I was blessed to have fallen into his light. You know, the theater in its entirety is built on relationships, right? There are very few industries where even your staunchest competitors you partner with on much of what you do, right? So I argue it's unique that way, right? The the, the same three to 500 people, you keep coming back into each other's aura and you work on projects. Some of them work. Sometimes when a project doesn't work, you bond even more in failure. And so he really believed in the long hall of all the relationships that you put together over the course of your career in the theater. I remember uh, once when a show didn't work out and I went to see him the next day to sort of say, Jimmy, I'm so sorry. You know, we all worked so hard. And he said to me, me, you know, forget about it. If you want to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And, you know, those are words I live by every single day of my life. I quote him every day. Do you remember that? You were there. 
Nick, now let's get to you. Can you tell our listeners, you know, what a typical day for you is? Because I, I've seen you, you're answering four phones, doing, you know, having three meetings, signing 15. What is a typical day like for you? You know, the thing I love most about my job is that it's never the same. Each and every day is different, right? So because there's a lot of real estate holdings, some days can be about real estate. Some days can be about show development. Some days can be about meetings about booking and distribution systems, you know, how the touring work. You know, what I get most energized and most inspired by is that often all of those things collide and it makes the day always interesting and unique because I like all the parts of it, right? So I'm not going to say my favorite part is dealing with real estate finance, but I'm going to say I like it because it it's part of what breaks up my day. And, you know, so I can meet with you about something and we can talk about creative teams in one minute. And the next minute I'm dealing with a bunch of bankers. And I don't want to say that in a negative way. It's just, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it's it's sort of like, okay, how are we going to do this? And when are we going to plan this restoration of this building? And how much time is there between the show and that show so that, and do we have enough time? And can we, can we get the carpet? What are the current zoning regulations, right? Which are always changing. Then you're always thinking three steps ahead, correct? Yeah, it, it tends to be a little bit of a puzzle. Like in, in, I think in many parts of the theater, like even with directors, right? They're putting together the puzzle of, you know, how something's going to look and feel an arc. It's the same with the writer. It's sort of where things come in the story, right? So my version of that is, how do you keep the theaters um, looking as good as they can look uh, with hits in them, hopefully, uh, and as little dark time as possible? Because that same ethos keeps the most people working most of the time. Because when a theater is dark, nobody's working. There's cost without revenue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of I know a lot of people don't realize that that even if a theater is dark, if there's nothing in it, there is still cost to the person who owns that theater. You know, everything from insurance, right, to electricity, to utilities, to some staff. You know, the theater can't just sit totally empty. Well, you know, it's one of the reasons I created this podcast called Broadway Biz, because I wanted the listeners to understand um, how the artistic side of theater, and it is a big artistic side, you know, with the with the financial side. That's why I was so pleased when you agreed, because I'd like to just talk about that a little bit. You're in a unique position, Nick. You're both a theater owner and a producer. I come to you with a script and, you know, and several bribes like chocolates and shit. I mean, I'm sorry, could I say... I'm kidding, listeners. But, you know, you, you, you know, you're in that unique position. Can you share with our listeners what considerations you make when evaluating a show for both as a producer and then as the theater owner? And are there similar, are there different considerations you make when you're wearing each, uh, when you're in each hat? You know, if we, if we, meaning Niederlander, um, are going to be the producer, it's either because of Jimmy or the organization's relationship with a particular artist, or there's a, a, a story that he and the organization have become passionate about telling, right? We don't produce for the sake of producing. We invest with other producers as part of a strategic plan, but we don't lead produce for the sake of it, right? So just like the way any producer would pick a project, you're picking it because of your relationships and what you're passionate about. You know, as I'm sure you've talked about tons, if you have to be a little bit crazy to decide to produce because you have to fall in love with something enough that you make enormous sacrifices to raise the money. There's a little bit of blind passion because when you begin a project, you know it's not going to be the same when you end it, right? And you don't know what that journey is going to be. So there's blind passion attached to that. And that, it, that type of risk-taking 
um, is a very special type of risk taking and not a lot of people can do it. In addition to raising the money, just the idea of constantly diving off a cliff. So that's the producing side. And then on the on the theater operating and on the booking side, it it has very much to do with relationships with people like you. And, you know, each theater operator has um, a set of main relationships, although we all work together, right? And so, you know, there are a half dozen producers. I always know what you're doing for the next three to five years, right? What you're passionate about and kind of where those things might be coming. And if they can fit into one th- one of our theaters or will, will we be involved with you in someone else's theater? We, we do care about what we put in our theater, so we do look at the stories. It doesn't mean we know what will work, because as Jimmy Sr., one of his other famous quotes is, no one can pick a hit from a flop. And that is a truism, right? But there's a big component of our business that, you know, it's right place, right time, right show, and right set of alignments, right? And you can have a brilliant show in the wrong season and it doesn't work for some reason. Isn't that the truth? That is so, or, or you have just the opposite, right? There are shows that we've all sat around in previews or out of town to go, oh my God, you know, what, what aren't these people seeing? I mean, this is, and then it opens and it's huge. That's the magic. That's the secret sauce of, of what everybody's contribution when you get to the opening night, no matter where you are in the chain of the theater, you know, um, in terms of the production, does it all align? Sometimes you can have a terrible preview period and then suddenly in the last three days, something comes together and you, I didn't think that was going to happen, but kaboom, I'd rather have it that way than the other way, right? I'm convinced this is going to work. And then you find yourself cascading into a, I don't know why I did that. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. What was I thinking? But then there's also the ones, as you said, that you are just, you know, you are sure it's going to, because the audience is loving it and the investors are throwing money at you and all those signs, right, that we have is like tent poles. And, and all that is working, you know, terrifically. And then it just opens and suddenly it's like crickets. No one cares. It just didn't open the way you thought. It didn't capture the, the attention of the audience and or the critics like you thought. And uh, you just, you just, you right? Have you ever had that where you stand in the back of the theater and yeah. you go, what happened? This one was like doing buff, yeah. you know, what happened? And uh, yeah, that's the thing that if, if you ever come up with the answer to that, Nick, you'll, you'll have a million dollar idea. That could be a billion dollar idea if I can solve that problem. As a theater owner, as opposed to a producer, when I come to you, let's just use me, and I come to you with a play that I'm passionate about. Uh, and, and you know, you can sense my passion. Maybe you don't, you know, feel it as much as I do, but you can feel it coming from me. And we have a relationship. What is it that, and not just me, this is now a general, but what is it that you as a theater owner look at to help you try and make that decision? Well, I think, you know, listen, and I think it's, it's, it's the conversation, right? So it's the size of the show, it's the content, it's the when do you want to do it? Because in the last 25 years, really since the mid-90s, you know, it's coming on 30 years, the theater situation is relatively tight, right? So sometimes schedule has an impact. You can't be too precious about the particular building anymore. I don't mean you. I just mean one in general. As theaters come up, if it is suitable, um, it may not be perfect, but if it is suitable. But, you know, I'm not going to say to you to put, you know, long day's journey in tonight into the Gershwin, right? So when I'm having the conversations, I try and be super respectful with the producer so that we're we're looking at what's really available, right? So if you have a particular type of show and I say, well, the what I see coming up in our chain in the next 12 to 18 months is X, Y, and Z theater, we will together look at it and go, hmm, well, maybe it's this theater, but it can't be those two. Because 
because they're just wrong artistically without being, it's not the difference of 100 seats or 100 more or less seats here or there. It's just a matter of um, the size and the scope of the art. And does it fit? It doesn't mean we don't do mismatches and it, because sometimes you have to just make things happen. Uh, you know, like we're in a period of time right now where, you know, someone says to me, I'd like the Richard Rogers. And I'll say, you know, I won't be here when the Richard Rogers is next available. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. You, you call the producer of Hamilton and tell them they have to move. Right. So. It makes total sense. And I have to say to our listeners, uh, I so respect that because you've actually had those conversations with me. Do you, in that conversation, because we've never had this, do you ever think about offering or talking to the producer about perhaps London first or because I know you own some theaters over there? Yeah, I mean, that that conversation used to happen more, um, but the theater situation in London is just as tight as Broadway. So I, I would say to, in today's marketplace, that happens a little bit less. But as you know, because we've done together out of town tryouts, you know, there are there are multiple ways for development. And one of them is a commercial out of town tryout, which is right for some shows and not right for others. And so Chicago, uh, where we operate and now Washington, D.C., where we operate, both can, are excellent if you want to do a commercial out of town engagement as part of your run into Broadway they both can provide that. So I will have that conversation for a number of shows. It's a regional theater for a number of shows. It's just a series of readings in a lab. You know, it really depends on the individual show. And even when you and I are having that conversation, how often I will say, even if we don't have a theater available, we still, because of our relationship, want to support you as a producer. So we might sign on you know, as a co-producer investor for you, you know, at, at the same time. Which I always appreciate. If for nothing else, not only for the for the financial help, but but you know, I think the Needlelander name attached to something is just it is like a theatrical you know stamp, like a good housekeeping stamp, you know. And I've always felt that way because you know you guys just don't jump on every bandwagon. And I believe because we and this is why this is great. Our listeners know this because of the conversations that you have with the producer and not just say, hey, sure, let me just take this book. You know, it is it is it's meaningful. I think that's a thing that distinguishes the Needlander organization as well. Moving on from that, when you uh, decide to jump on board with a show, either as a theater owner or the theater owner and investor, things like that. Do you ever consider or does the consideration about how this will travel around the country, around the world, does that ever enter into your consciousness about how that will look? Um, I think it's, I, I think it's all, I think it's ever present. Um, but I don't, I don't know that it's the determiner, right? Like I don't, I've never found myself saying, well, we'll do this on Broadway, but it's not going to really work, but it'll be great on tour. But I think every producer, you know, is mindful that if you're successful on Broadway or in the West End, that enhances your potential for a distribution system, right? So just because of the way that producers' contracts work with the authors, right, and, and, and subsidiary rights, right? So it's at the very least subsidiary rights, but it could be the continuation of the producer's license, you know, especially if you have a hit musical and you have a, a turns into a mega musical because the public decides it's it's in the zeitgeist and, and they take it on as their own and you end up with five or 10 companies around the country and the world, right? You know, then you become your own industry if you end up that your you know little cottage industry within the industry, right? Which is extraordinary, and we all hope for that. But I don't ever think this is just a New York show, and it won't have any further potential, and that's the decision. Or this is a show really for touring, and it doesn't have New York potential, and that's the decision. But it but it's kind of all in the soup. Yeah. And I'm assuming, Nick, that you must at some point, because you know this probably better than most people at this moment, um, you know what it takes 
two tour a show. And that includes, you know, and I'm going to have uh, Stephen and Brett on talking about how a tour booker works. But you must know things like, okay, how many trucks does it take? How many hours does the load intake? How many, you know, how quickly can we get from city to city? And, and can something be a multi-week sit down or does it have to be a one week? So all of that must be factored in, in, in your uh, depth of knowledge of this. True. I mean, yeah. And I think the, I think, I think if I were to say anything about that, I think I would say that where we periodically as an industry slip up when something becomes the lion King or wicked or Hamilton, you can build it as identical to New York as you want and because you know it's going to sit in Chicago for three years it's not going to sit in there Chicago for two weeks or three weeks right um and then I think when you need you know you need to do something inexpensively I think we all can kind of figure that out and I think sometimes when we're in the middle we build things that are too big right and then we have to make course corrections so it's just kind of interesting that no matter what your experience is, everyone can find themselves in that spot. And I'm like, gosh, I did that again. I should have thought about this more, more in advance. And, and, you know, the more you can do in advance to get the economics, particularly the weekly operating economics, both in New York and on tour, as low as possible, that is that is going to serve all shows in the longer haul better, you know? And I think, and I think we all lose sight of that a little bit when we're in the middle of making the soup. (laughs) Well, it, it is a question that I always ask, you know, most of my guests, you know, there does come a point where an artistic member of your team usually the director, but it could be a set designer or a costume designer or lights, you know, they will ask for something because they have to have it. You know, like if I don't have the dancing waters or the three elephants on the stage or whatever, it's just not going to work. And, you know, sometimes it's the producer, but sometimes it's actually the theater owner that just says, you know, we can't do that because, you know, it needs, then we need to have exit ramps or we need to have certain facilities. You know, if you have to have animals, you know, you have to have a place to put the animals. I remember we did Legally Blonde and I looked at you and I said, Nick, we need a dressing room just for the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget that look like, uh, are you pulling my, it was like a few seconds where you looked at me like, are you yeah. pulling my leg? <laughs> <laughs> there's things like that does it ever does it ever ha, is there ever and i'm not asking for specifics uh but has that ever come up in in your experience where you've just had to say no to an artistic person a producer person you, you know mostly like the like i said an artistic person i'm sorry we just can't do that yeah i think it comes up I think it comes up um, mostly because so many of the theaters are near 100-year-old landmarks. The only time you really want to say no is if something would... Safety always comes first for the audience and the employees and for the building structure. And these buildings are built very soundly. You know, they were built nearly 100 years ago, many of them. And they are very secure structures. But where we will say no is if anything seems to alter or even temporarily alter the structural integrity of the building, that'll kind of be an automatic no. I've never really had anybody push back on me about that, right? Because artistically, there's always another solution. There just always is, right? Uh, if you have enough time and you, you put enough thinking behind something, you can you can do that. And you know how the theater agreements work. You know, you can make adjustments to the theater as long as you restore it when the production is finished. Certainly, when Cats went into the Winter Garden originally, you know, the entire theater was painted and blacked out. And that's certainly a landmarked building. And also, I would say the restoration work that's been done in the classic buildings in the last 25 to 30 years 
has been very high end restoration. I think all the theater operators have been really, it's been amazing, the beautiful, beautiful design and restorative work. So I would say I'm a, I'm more reticent. Like I won't let anybody just paint blackout paint the proscenium arch anymore. What they do is they clad the proscenium arch so that the arch is protected and the the show gets the visual of something framed, but without without damaging the paint. Um, and so we have found new solutions than we used to use or used to be used before our era, like you know, fifty years ago. It's true. I'm always asked that question when I ever give a backstage tour, like, and and now, you know, sets move on and off and up and down and sideways. And, you know, and there's many theaters have limited uh, uh, wing space, right? I'm being kind. And they ask, how did shows play there? And I have to explain that, you know, 40, 50 years ago, sets were painted drops. Yeah, they were in the air. They weren't on the ground. Uh, another thing I wanted us to touch on uh, before we have to go is could you talk a little bit about how what you feel is the the price difference between producing and running something in London, since you have London theaters, and, and in New York? I know I'm asked that all the time, and I would love to hear from your perspective as a theater owner what you think that that answer might be. When you work, you think it costs less money. Um, and it, and it does. There is there there are elements that are more flexible um, in the West End, and and from a production standpoint, there's a percentage of savings. Right. Um, there was a period of time when there was a lot more theater availability across both Broadway and the West End, where people would really potentially make that choice. I'm going to start in London because it's less expensive. I think that was also um, true because there was a period of time, you know, from let, let's say 1979 to 1993, 94, where you, you know, from Evita through Miss Saigon, uh, their original productions, where Andrew and Cameron and Bublil and Schoenberg, right? They, those mega musicals were uh, all emanating out of the West End. And, and so it became a model that people felt uh, was a useful one. And, but when the theater situation tightened up, then people started working uh, and looking again in the West End, in the West End, and on Broadway for Broadway, right? I can't parse down those specific things. Uh, and, you know, they spend less on advertising on a weekly basis than is required in New York. For a very long time, television was not an active part of their campaigns, whereas in New York, it's a required part of your campaign. There are different, there, there, there are differences um, like that. Labor and its structure is different um, in the West End than it, than it is here. And I also want to remind people, too, that for the longest time, less so now in the UK, because it's just the state of the world, but for the longest time in the UK, there was a lot more governmental you know, funding for, for the arts, you know, separate councils, cities, you know, counties, things like that. Places like the National and, you know, these, these what we would call regional theaters, there was a lot of support that we, you know, over the years has, has unfortunately whittled down a little bit on Broadway. You know, the NEA doesn't have as big of a grant, you know, and, and corporate donors, you know, remember when they used to have Texaco Presents and, and AT&T Presents and, you know, those kinds of things have gotten, you know, less and less as I believe there are more and more places for these corporations to advertise. The, the beauty of the theater is that it manages to always reinvent itself. So you, what you are referring to is what, what we came into and what is changing now. But each time there's an adversity, people figure out the next way to develop their materials. So 
you know, we're not using the same system that R&H, Rogers and Hammerstein used in the 40s, right? Um, but what worked for them wouldn't work for us. And what worked for us 20 years ago for the generation that follows us, something else is going to work for. And that's what I love about the theater, right? It is you, It is both universal and historic and whatever ancient culture you want, wherever you want to attribute storytelling, right? There are different versions and they made them different ways, right? But they made stories and they made theater, right? Why do you think that is, Nick? Why do you think theater will always endure or don't, or do you? Well, no, I, I, I of course do. Um, uh, as you know, I'm of Greek descent. And so one of the philosophers, and I'm not even going to say which one because I will get it wrong and then someone will correct me, um, whether it was Plato or Socrates, right, said that, you know, the, the thing about the theater is the theater is, is important to your soul, right? It, it, it is part of what makes up your inner being and how you feel and how you interact and how you reflect on the world. And while it sounds heady initially, it's actually primal in so many ways, right? And so I think what makes it endure is no matter what live entertainment and the interaction of someone telling a story and you absorbing that story with people around you, not necessarily people you're talking to, right? That you share a communal experience that everybody gets touched and part of how you emotionally react is based on the reaction of the people around you. Are they laughing? Are they crying? What are you taking away from it? Did you feel anxious, right? All of those things are what creates the human experience that you then take out into your life and your own interactions with people, right? So that's why the stories and what stories are being told become important because there are moments, Angels in America, where where the play leads the culture to a place it, it was not comfortable going to yet, but needed the play to help them. People needed to be able to see that so that they could begin their period of understanding and culture and theater then feed back and forth on each other. And I don't see that ever going away. It didn't go away in ancient Greece, or, but it is important that we always work on how we remain relevant, right? And that goes to the stories we tell. And over time, the stories we tell do change, right? And, and we can each pick our own pieces of theater that we feel advanced the culture right, versus others. Something that was challenging, and sometimes when we look at revivals of either plays or musicals, I often think that was a really challenging piece in 1954 or 1946, right? It feels a little rudimentary now because the culture has advanced so much, right? So now how do we go back and we look at it versus what it was originally and what it contributed culturally originally versus now what the culture can benefit from it in reflection? Very well said. And if it's done right, I think you can take something from a different era and turn it, turn a mirror on it so it now look at it through the lens, you know, of the 21st century, where we are, 20, 21, 22. And I think that's what's incredible about the art form. It, it, there's always a different way to tell that story, just like, like any good art. You know, there's always a different way to look at it and see it. And periodically you see something and you say, that doesn't need to be done anymore. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Or sometimes you look at something and say, it shouldn't have been done in the first place yet. <laughs> yes, that's right. Because hopefully, hopefully over time, the culture advances in a way that certain things don't need to be done anymore. That's perfectly said. Nick Scandalius, this has been, I could stay on the phone and talk to you for hours. And you know what? We have. This will be so yeah, real. We, we have. We have. Although I think this may be our shortest conversation ever. Well, that's because there were no cocktails involved, Hal. Oh, we're going to have to fix that. You're right. That's what's missing. Next time we do this, I, I want a cocktail. On me.
But Nick, not so easy because before you leave, before we say goodbye, and all good things have to come to an end, including this program, but I have three what I call rapid fire questions for you. And all I ask is you, you know, I ask them, they're not tricky questions, they're just your personal taste. And don't overthink it, okay? First thing, just say it, all righty? So here's the first one. What is your favorite musical? Evita changed my life. It's the reason I'm in the theater. Wow. You just warmed my heart. The second question is, what was the wackiest moment that ever happened to you in the theater? And by wacky, I don't mean bad. It could be silly. It could be funny. It could be, I can't believe I just saw that kind of thing. But what would you say is that wacky moment? I will say the first time I got a phone call that the deluge curtain went off and and my relationship with with four or five or six people on Sunset Boulevard uh, sitting there well into the night with the hair dryers drying the scores and then going and drinking a lot of red wine into the night is one of the craziest things that ever happened. And then to have had it happen two more times after that. Um, you know, was crazy. And drying off a 36th, and, and, and with sunset, drying off a 36,000 pound house. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> it, it was one of the all time, uh, yeah, you know, that, that was one of the all time wacky moments. Now, weren't you glad with me and Millie it was just drying the elevator? That's right, exactly. I mean, seriously. I mean, seriously. Okay, so so the third question is, so the lesson you learned from that wacky moment was? Always be better prepared, right? And, and, and you have to be prepared for the unexpected, right? And, and how you get through unexpected things and difficult moments in the theater or in anything in life. Uh, stay calm. Use your best judgment. And, and don't panic. And have a big bucket and a mop. <laughs> and always carry a hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Scandell is, I love you. I thank you so much for taking the time to join with us today. Um, have a great summer. My love to your entire family. And I know you and I will talk soon. Okay. Love you right back. Thanks, Hal. Big kiss. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Broadway Biz is part of the Broadway Podcast Network, is produced by Dylan Marie Parent and Kevin Connor, and is edited by Derek Gunther. Our theme music is by Nell Benjamin and Larry O'Keefe. Be sure to subscribe to Broadway Biz and follow us on Instagram at Broadway Biz Podcast.